This is the Ford Theater, a full hour of radio drama. Our play today, Counselor at Law, a thrilling story of a great criminal lawyer. What? Refuse the case? There's a $100,000 fee if I win it. Why, George Simon, Wilma Crayfield's a friend of ours. She's dined at our house. You can't take a case against her. So have hundreds of other people, darling. Does that mean that I can't take any case involving their interests? It's a pretty high price to pay for having people to dinner. The Ford Theater, presented by the Ford Motor Company, makers of Ford, Lincoln, and Mercury cars, and Ford trucks, farm tractors, and industrial engines. In the past three generations, millions of Americans have learned to rely on Ford products. For three generations, Ford has led the way in the development of more dependable, more economical transportation. Today, in the third generation, more than eight million Americans prefer Ford products. They know from experience, you can depend on Ford. As spokesman for the management of the Ford Theater, may we present the distinguished playwright, producer, and actor, co-author of State of the Union and Life with Father, Howard Lindsay. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Great lawyers, like great soldiers, great doctors, and great scientists, are invested in the popular mind with a kind of excitement and glamour peculiarly their own. A great criminal lawyer has an added appeal, for upon his knowledge, his skill, his eloquence, his adroitness, whether in prosecution or defense, depend matters of freedom or bondage, even life or death. The action of our play today, Elmer Rice's notable drama, Counselor at Law, revolves around the private and public life of George Simon, a poor East Side boy who, at the time our curtain rises, has reached the very pinnacle of the legal profession. judge for yourselves something of its busy atmosphere as we are projected into the reception room of the eminent New York law firm of... Simon and Tedesco. Who's calling, please? Mr. McGee, I'll connect you with Miss Gordon, his secretary. Mr. McGee of the National Security Company calling Mr. Simon. All righty, go ahead. Simon and Tedesco. Oh, it's you, Gracie. Hey, Gracie, you know what happened? He called me. Yeah, this morning. And you know what he said to me? I thought you was dead and buried. And I said, no thanks, I don't look so good in black. I said, yeah, sure, I missed you. Like Booth Miss Lincoln. That's what I told him. Oh, wait a minute, Gracie. Yes, Miss Gordon, Mr. Darwin's waiting out here. And Miss LaRue. Yes, Miss Gordon. Hello, Simon and Tedesco. Mr. Galoopy, I'll put you right through to Mr. Tedesco. Hello, Simon and Tedesco. Oh, yes, Mrs. Chapman. Yeah, I did, Mrs. Chapman. I gave Mr. Miss Gordon your message. I told her you wanted to thank Mr. Simon. Hey, Gracie, you know who's on the other line? Adora Chapman, the one that shot her husband. Yeah, Mrs. Chapman. I bet it feels good to be walking around. Outside, I mean. Yeah, I'll tell him, Mrs. Chapman. Oh, he sure is. Why, Mr. Simon talked to that jury. I read it in the paper this morning. It said half the jury were crying like babies. Okay, Mrs. Chapman, I sure will. Bessie? Yes, Senator Miss Gordon. Senator Wells from Mr. Simon in Washington, the Shore Motel, it's urgent. Yes, Miss Gordon. Oh, uh, Mr. LaRue, you're next. Mr. Simon will see you in just a minute. <laughs> Senator, 12.30 tomorrow at the Lawyers Club. Fine. And give my regards to that charming daughter of yours. Goodbye. Rexy? Yes, Mr. Simon? Who's next? 
Lillian LaRue on the breach of promise case. I'll see that blonde bombshell right now. Bessie, will you ask Miss LaRue to come in? Yes, Miss Gordon. Here, Rexy, before you go, take a letter to Mrs. Moran. You know, the one who runs a grocery store on the east side next to where my mother lives? Yes, sir. Dear Mrs. Moran, I'm returning here with your money order for $50 as I was actuated... No, no, strike that out. You won't understand it. As I handled your daughter's case only because of our old friendship and because of my interest in you and your family, and I cannot accept the fee. Good morning, Miss LaRue. Just take a seat, won't you? Hi. Rexy, you'd better get me Mr. Vandenbogen on the phone. Yes, sir. I'm getting Skyler's lawyer on the phone. Oh. I think we'll be able to wind up that case of yours pretty soon. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's him now. Good morning, Mr. Vandenbogen. How are you today? That's fine. Well, have you got any word for me about the little lady in the beach of promise suit? Is that so? Well, I don't think 15000 would be acceptable to my client. Hey, wait a minute, Mr. Simon. Quiet. Huh? Well, frankly, Mr. Vandenbogen, I don't agree with you. I've had a good deal of experience with juries, and I know they're inclined to be extremely sympathetic to a young girl who has fallen in love with a man upon his explicit promise of marriage, especially when the young man is a millionaire and the young lady is obliged to earn her own living. Well, that's our position, Mr. Vandenbogen. Yes, I'll wait until tomorrow. Thank you. Goodbye, Mr. Vandenbogen. Fifteen thousand? Gee, you think you can get more than fifteen thousand? He came up to fifteen, and I think you'll go to twenty-five. Oh, gosh. I sure am grateful to you, Mr. Simon. Oh, well, that's all right. That's part of my business. It'll probably take another day or two. Mr. Simon, I know you're a busy man, but uh, any evening you find you have a little time on your hands... If you'd uh, just call me up... You're I... right, Miss LaRue. I am a busy man. Well, I just thought you might Miss like Miss LaRue, to... get this straight. You're a client of mine, and that's all you are. You see this picture on the table? This lady, Miss LaRue, happens to be my wife. And it so happens I'm in love with her. Rexy! Rexy, will you show this lady out? Well, if that's the way you see it... When I have news for you, Miss LaRue, Miss Gordon will call you and give it to you. Goodbye, Miss LaRue. Goodbye. Rexy... How much of a retainer did we get from Miss LaRue? $2,500. When the Schuylers come through, as soon as the agreements are signed, send her a bill for 5000 I want her to get it while she's still grateful. You can go in now, Mr. Darwin. Hey, Gracie, you know who was sitting here just now? Roy Darwin. I never heard of Roy Darwin. What's the matter with you, Gracie? Don't you read the papers? Didn't you never see his picture in riding clothes with a lot of dogs and horses? Roy Darwin! I'm very sorry, Mr. Darwin, but I simply can't discuss it. But after all, Simon, Mrs. Crayfield happens to be a first cousin of mine. Yes, I know. And if you break her late husband's will, it would involve her in a rather painful scandal. So I was rather hoping that your friendship for Wilma... An attorney can't let such considerations stand in the way of his practice, Mr. Darwin. I've been retained by the Crayfield family, and I must represent their interests. Well, I can't very well hope to persuade you. Of course, she is a friend of Cora's, too. My wife would be the last person in the world to ask me to give up an important case because she happens to be socially acquainted with one of the interested parties. Well, that's that, then. That's really what I came to see you about. I don't want to take up any more of your time. I'm sorry I can't oblige you, Mr. Darwin. Well, if you can't, you can't. Oh, by the way, I hate to ask you this, but I wonder if you could help me out of a temporary embarrassment. Why, I'd be glad to do anything that's... How much do you need? Oh, just a couple of thousand or so. I'll only need it until July. I've got quite a bit of money coming in then from my mother's trust fund. Well, I guess I can manage that. Thanks very much, old man. I'll be glad to give you my note, of course. Rexy. Yes, Mr. Simon? Will you come in, please? Yes, sir. Cora tells me you and she are going off to Europe. Yes, that's right. It's about time we had a little trip together. We'll have been married five years on the 18th. You know, Roy, my wife's a wonderful woman. The truth is, I... <laughs> I guess I don't have to tell you about Cora. As a matter of fact, she should be here any minute now. She's picking me up for lunch. Oh, Rexy, I want you to draw a check for $2,000 on my personal account to the order of Roy Darwin. And a promissory note payable in three months. It'll only take a minute, Roy. If you'll just go with Rexy into her office, you can sign the note right there. Of course. It's this way, Mr. Darwin. Rexy. Yes, Mr. Simon? How much did I tell you to send a bill to Miss LaRue for? 5000 Better make it 7500 Simon and Tedesco. One moment, please. 
Oh, Mrs. Simon. Yes? Miss Gordon says Mr. Simon will be with you in just a moment as soon as he's finished with this call. Who's calling, please? Clerk of the surrogate's court. For Mr. Tedesco? One moment, please. That little beehive your husband has here. Yes, it is, Roy. Sometimes I wish... You wish what, Cora? Well, I wish he wouldn't take all the cases he does. (laughs) <laughs> they all pay, don't they? I suppose so. Only sometimes it's a bit awkward. Wilma Crayfield called me up this morning. The poor thing's in a terrible state. She heard the Crayfield family is engaging George to contest the will. As a matter of fact, that's what I came to talk to him about. And? What'd he say? He's absolutely firm about taking it. Oh, but Roy, he mustn't. Think how awful it would be for poor Wilma. Well, perhaps you can persuade him. He wouldn't listen to me. Tell me, Cora, is it definitely settled that George is going to Europe with you? Yes. We're sailing on the Paris. The Paris. Well, that's that. Cora, when am I going to see you? <laughs> I, I don't know exactly. You couldn't make it for lunch today? No, I'm lunching with George. Yes, I know. He told me. But how about tea? Cora, I've got to see well, you. Yes, Roy, I can make it for tea. I have an appointment for a fitting, but I can change that. Well, shall we say four at the apartment? Not so loud. Why, Cora, what are you... I see what you mean. Little pitchers have big ears. Exactly. Mr. Simon Spree now, Mrs. Simon. Will you come in? Yes, I will. Well, Roy, it was a pleasant surprise running into you this way. <laughs> Au revoir. Au revoir, Cora. Goodbye, Miss Gordon. Goodbye, Mr. Darwin. This way, Mrs. Simon. Your husband said to go right in. What's the matter? Can a man kiss his wife whom he hasn't seen for hours? Of course, dear. Only I'm sure you've ruined my beautiful mouth. I just put it on. Oh, dear, yes, you have. Oh, I'm sorry, darling. And I'm sorry I kept you waiting. You must be starving. Well, I am rather hungry. I've been running errands all morning, getting ready to sail. Sweetheart, I've got to see John Tedesco for a few minutes. He seems to think it's important. Why don't you go ahead and start your lunch, and I'll join you in 10 or 15 minutes. Perhaps I'll do that. I've got lots of things to attend to after lunch. Only, George, there's something I must talk to you about first. Of course, honey. Nothing's wrong, is it? It's about Wilma Crayfield. George, you're not thinking seriously of trying to break that will, are you? Yes, darling, very seriously. But, George, you can't do that. Why, darling? Well, it's a scandalous case. Yes, it certainly is. Do you know the facts? No, I don't, and I can't understand why you'd want to have anything to do with such a case. There's a $100,000 fee in it if I win. The estate will come to over $4 million. You don't need the money, especially money you get by such means. By such means? I don't understand you, darling. But think of what this is going to do to Wilma. But think of what she did to Crayfield. Deceived him for 15 years of their married life. Well, he's dead and buried, and none the worse off for it. And Wilma Crayfield's a friend of mine. Well, you know her too, George. She dined at our house. Yes, but so have hundreds of other people, darling. Does that mean that I can't take any case in which their interests are involved? <laughs> it's a pretty high price to pay for having people to dinner. This is a very special case. It's a friend's reputation that's involved. Her reputation can't be saved anyhow. If I didn't take the case, a hundred other lawyers would be glad to. <laughs> well, at least you'd have made a magnanimous gesture. Yes, I should say so. A hundred thousand dollars. That's not the way law is practiced, darling. I don't see why it isn't possible to practice law like a gentleman. I never laid any claims to being a gentleman, dear. I didn't mean it in that way, George. Heavens, nobody admires you more than I for the handicaps you've overcome. And I'm not complaining, George. It's just a little embarrassing for me to have your name constantly associated with these sensational cases. After all, it's my name, too, you know. And the sort of people I've always known can't help thinking it's a little strange. Sweetheart, the last thing in the world I want to do is to cause you any embarrassment. My one object in life is to make you happy. Oh, I didn't mean to imply for a minute that it's been intentional, George. Only... I don't even want it to be unintentional. Listen, darling, would it make you any happier if I dropped this Crayfield case? It would make me feel that I was married to a man who recognizes the value of social amenities. Okay, I'll drop it. Thank you, George, dear. You feeling better now? Yes, much better. Well, do I rate a kiss? George. George, my mouth. Oh, I'm sorry, darling. You know, Cora, you'll make a gentleman of me yet. (laughs) Well, I think I'll go on to lunch now. All right, sweetheart. Where'll you be? At the Marguerite. I'll be there in ten minutes. Uh, Go out through this door, darling. I know the way. Au revoir, darling. Goodbye, dear. Oh, Mr. Seidman. Yes, Rexy, what is it? Did you know your mother's outside? What? 
How long has she been here? I don't know. I just went out. Mama! Bessie, why didn't you tell me my mother was waiting? Oh, it's only a few minutes, George. I'm sorry, Mr. Simon. I thought you... What do you mean, you thought? Don't you announce people when they come in? You, Charlie, don't you know any better than to have my mother sitting around waiting? Please, Georgie, I told them not to disturb you. I've got plenty of time. But, Mama, I don't want you to have to wait. Charlie McFadden and me, we were having a nice talk about the old days. When we were living on Avenue B. And I was living right across the street in number 319. Yes. (laughs) Well, it's many a long day ago. And you were still a little boy, Georgie. He was selling papers, he was. <laughs> Georgie, you know, you didn't tell me that Charlie McFadden was working for you. Well, I was telling the chief how you got me my new start in life. Yeah. You know, Mrs. Simon, I was nothing but a jail boy. Did a couple of stretches for burglary. And that's where I'd ended my days if it wasn't for him. Charlie, he says, if you'll go straight, I'll give you a job in my office. Mm-hmm. And I've been here ever since. Process server. Now and then I do a little uh, private detective work. I tell you, Mrs. Simon, that son of yours is a prince. Even though he is here, hit this him, he says. Oh, Charlie, Charlie, will you cut the blather? I know, Charlie. You're not the only one he's helped. He's a good boy. Mama, will you come in? I haven't got all day. Oh, sure, sure. And goodbye, Mr. McFadden. Hey, goodbye, ma'am. It sure was good to see you again. Me too. Bessie, the next time my mother comes in, I want her announced right away. Do you understand? Georgie, please. Yes, sir. And don't you forget it. Oh, Cora was just here. If she'd known she missed you, she'd have been real upset. Georgie, will you please stop worrying? (laughs) Sit down, Mama, sit down. Oh, thank you. And, uh, Rexy, ask Mr. Tedesco to wait. I'll be with him in a few minutes. Yes, sir. You know, George, that's a nice girl, that Miss Gordon. Oh, she's a wonderful secretary. I couldn't get along without her. Mm Mm-hmm. Mama, I was going to call you. You know, Cora and I are going to Europe. That's just what you should do, Georgie. A man and wife should be just as close together as they can. Especially when a man has a wife like Cora. She's wonderful, a wonderful woman, Mama. Mm -hmm. She has a good husband and you too, Georgie. Oh, of course. According to you, nobody would be good enough for me. It's a wonder the King of England never asked me to become his son-in-law. Well, I'm sure his daughters couldn't do any better. (laughs) All right, laugh. But it doesn't change my opinion. Georgie, I... I know you're busy, but I've got to talk to you. Is anything wrong? You feeling all right? Of course I'm feeling all right. Well, what's the matter then? What do you look so serious about suddenly? Georgie... You mustn't be angry with me. Oh, I'm not going to be angry, Mama. What is it? Your brother Dave called me up this morning. Well? Now, you told me you wouldn't be angry. I'm not angry. Go ahead. He needs a little money. Money? What does he need money for this time? A check came back from the bank. You mean he gave somebody a bum check? He made a little mistake in his balance. A little mistake in his balance, my foot. He's a crook, that's what he is. Georgie, is that a way to talk about your own brother? Brother, a fine brother he is. I'm through with him. He can get out of this, this himself. Georgie, please. No, no, let him go to jail. That's where he belongs anyhow. Oh, Georgie, be a good boy. It's the last time, I promise. He won't do anything again. Yes. How many times have I heard that one before, too? I'm through with him, I tell you. Georgie. I'm supposed to be an important lawyer around here. I'm mixed up in more front page cases than any lawyer in New York. People from old families come in and think I'm doing them a favor if I accept their retainers. If I don't happen to like a millionaire's looks, I throw him out of the office. It's fine for me, isn't it, to have a brother going around getting himself pinched in gambling raids, handing out rubber checks? It's great, isn't it? Georgie, please. Just this once? No. I... I don't often ask you for anything special. Do it for me. Not for him. Okay, Mama. If you put it that way. Rexy. Yes, sir? Rexy, make out a check for my brother. My mother will give you the amount. Yes, sir. Mama, I've got to see my partner. Now, will you excuse me? All right, Georgie. Thank you. i got to go home now anyway. Goodbye, Mama. Take a taxi downtown. Oh, the bus is good enough for me, Georgie. <laughs> Rexy said you wanted to see me, John. Is anything important? Well, it may not be important. Only I thought I ought to warn you. After all, you are my partner. Warn me? What's the trouble? I don't know, George. Maybe it's not worth mentioning. Only I thought you ought to hear about it. Mm -hmm. I got a call this morning from upstate. You know, my cousin Ed, warden up at Elmira. Yeah, sure, I know him. How's he getting along up there? Well, he tipped me off to something that I think you ought to know. Well, go ahead. You ever remember handling a case for some fella named, um... Wait a minute, I wrote it down somewhere. Yeah, here it is. Bryson. Remember him? Yes, I remember. James Bryson. Yeah. I defended him on a larceny charge about eight or nine years ago and got him an acquittal. What about it? 
Was there something about an alibi? Yes, he had an alibi. That's why the jury acquitted him. Yeah. Well, it seems there was a guy named Whitey Cushing who was mixed up in the case. Is that right? Yes. He established the alibi for Bryson. That's it. Well, this Cushing is doing a stretch up at Elmira. It seems he had a session with your friend, Francis Clark Baird, who's a member of the parole board. Yes. Well, what about it? It seems he's been giving Francis Clark Baird some song and dance about the alibi in the Bryson case being framed up. What do you mean, framed up? Now, I'm just telling you what Ed told me over the phone last night. This guy Baird is on the uh, grievance committee of the Bar Association, too, isn't he? Yes, I think so. And he'd like to get something on you. He sure would. I've licked him to a fair you well in a half a dozen cases. He'd like to get even. Well, according to Ed, Baird thinks he can cook up some kind of a disbarment proceeding against you out of this Bryson case. He's having Cushing brought down to New York next week to take his deposition. Oh, he is, is he? Well, let him. What do I care? He's got nothing on me. That is what I told Ed. There's nothing to it, Ed, I said. George is too smart a boy to let himself get mixed up with something like that. Only I thought I'd better tip you off. Thanks, John. It was nice of you to let me know. <laughs> what do you think of that silk stocking trying to pull a thing like that on me? <laughs> well, you know how it is, George. These guys whose ancestors came over on the Mayflower don't like to see the boys from the east side sitting in the high places. We're just a lot of riffraff to them. Yeah, that's right. Well, so long, John, and thanks again. Don't mention it. Rexy! Yes, Mr. Simon? Listen, Rexy, I got a job for you. It's urgent. About eight or nine years ago, I defended a fellow called James Bryson in General Sessions. I want to get hold of this Bryson right away. Let everything else go until you locate him. You understand? Right. Then get me all the papers out of the files. People against James Bryson. Also, send up to General Sessions and order a transcript of the stenographer's minutes of the trial. Do you get that? Yes, sir. Also, get hold of... Hey, wait a minute. Right away, before you do anything else, call up the Marguerite restaurant. All right. Get Mrs. Simon to the phone. Yes, sir. Tell her something's come up, something important. Tell her I won't be able to have lunch with her. Tell her how sorry I am. <laughs> As the distant threat of possible disbarment looms on the horizon, George Simon is obliged to cast all other matters aside and rush to the preparation of his own defenses. While Rexy is phoning Mrs. Simon to put off the lunch date, let us be faithful to our accustomed intermission engagement with Kenneth Banghart speaking for the Ford Motor Company. In your community, there's a showroom that's unusually crowded these days. If you've passed that showroom, you've probably noticed the crowds. And if you stopped and entered, you know why the crowds are there. To see a new car, a beautiful new car. They're there to see the all-new 1949 Mercury. And the Mercury showroom in your community is not extraordinary. Hundreds of thousands of people have crowded showrooms from coast to coast to see not just a new model, but the all-new 1949 Mercury. They came to see a car that is really new. From the first graceful line on the blueprint to the outstanding performance it delivers on the road. And reports from all over the nation show that they liked it. The Lincoln Mercury Division of the Ford Motor Company planned, designed, and built the 1949 Mercury with the idea of creating all new beauty, comfort, and performance for you. The 1949 Mercury was planned to give you an all-new driving experience, designed to give you all-new handsome appearance and pleasure in riding, built to give you all new pride in owning a big and beautiful car. That's why Mercury has a powerful new eight-cylinder V-type engine built exclusively for Mercury, a new, more rugged chassis, new springing, new super balloon tires and wider, safer rims, new, more comfortable interiors, and all new beauty and style. The 1949 Mercury was created by one of the world's foremost builders of fine cars to give you new pleasure and pride. Today, at any Mercury showroom, you can see for yourself the result of that planning and building. Visit the Mercury showroom in your community and see not just a new model, but the all-new 1949 Mercury. The second act of Counselor at Law will be heard after a brief pause for station identification. Act 
two of the Ford Theater's presentation of Counselor at Law, especially adapted for this program by John Houseman. It's the next day, and the faithful Rexy has lost little time in locating young James Bryson. He is seated now in George Simon's tastefully appointed office, facing the great lawyer across a massive mahogany desk. Now listen to me, Bryson. This is important. Yeah, 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 I know, Mr. Simon. Bryson, has anybody been talking to you lately about that case of yours? Well, no, Mr. Simon, they haven't. Nobody's approached you or asked you any questions? No, sir. Why, is there anything... The reason I've sent for you is that I want to put you on your guard. There's a complication that's come up, and you've got to be prepared to answer a lot of questions. What, uh... What kind of a complication, Mr. Simon? Well, it seems that this fellow Whitey Cushing has been doing some talking. Well, he's up in Elmira doing 20 years for manslaughter. I know it. That's why. He's been telling some people that we cooked up that alibi. Well, Moses, does that mean they're going to come after me again? Yes, they're likely to. Mr. Simon, what am I going to do? Now, don't get excited, Bryson. I think maybe everything will be all right if you just do what I tell you to. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure I will. She was, I got a wife and a family now. I don't know what I'd do if they what came What you've after... got to do is stick by that alibi story, you understand? Yeah, yeah, sure, Mr. Simon, whatever you say. I'll do the best I can for you. And I guess between us we can fix it up all right. But we've got to stick together, Bryson. Yeah, yeah, you betcha. And, uh... And you think everything's going to be all right? Well, I hope it is. Why? Don't you? Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Only, only I was just thinking... What? Uh, well, I, I was thinking in case they should look up the hospital records. What hospital records? The hospital records of Whitey Cushing. What hospital records of Whitey Cushing? What are you talking about? Well, you, you know the day it happened, the day he said I was in his house... He was in the hospital. You mean to say that the day you robbed the bathhouse, Whitey Cushing was in the hospital? Yeah. Are you sure of this, Bryson? Yeah, sure. That's why I had to pay him $250 to testify. He was afraid they'd find out about him being in the hospital that day. Wait a minute. Are you trying to tell me that your alibi wasn't on the level? Well, I I, I needed a bed, Mr. Simon, and I never told you, but I, I thought maybe you ought to know now. Good Lord. Oh, this certainly changes the whole picture. What hospital was it, do you know? Well, I, I think it was the parlor clinic. Mr. Simon... All right, Bryson, i got to think about this. I may ask you to come in again in a day or two, so keep in touch. Goodbye. Bye, right, Mr. Simon. I hope everything's going to be all right. Yes, so do I. <laughs> Mr. Baird's secretary. George Simon is calling. Oh, I see. Mr. Baird's not in. This is the fifth time I've called, Mr. Simon. When's he expected? When do you think he will be? Give me that phone. I'll talk to Just him Just one moment, please. Hello, this is Mr. Simon. You know when Mr. Baird will be in? Oh, I see. Well, you know where I can reach him? Well, he's in town, isn't he? Huh. Oh, I see. You don't know that either. You think you're likely to hear from him during the day? Yes, it's all pretty indefinite, isn't it? Well, if you do hear from him, will you tell him I called him and ask him if he'll be good enough to call me back? Thank you very much. Goodbye. You think that Baird could afford to employ a more convincing liar? Rexy, how about Mrs. Simon? Couldn't you get her out at the house? I called and they said she left around 11. Did you try the apartment? Yes, I did. We'll keep trying. Right. I'll be in Mr. Tedesco's office. Yes, sir. John, I got to talk to you. Why, sure, George. Hey, fellow, what's the matter? You look all in. Yeah, that's right. I didn't get much sleep last night. What's the trouble? John, I'm in a spot. It hasn't anything to do with what it I told you. It sure has. I had a talk with that fellow Bryson, the kid I helped out of a jam. Yeah, and? Well, I guess my friend Mr. Francis Clark Baird has got me just about where he wants me. He has enough on me to break me in pieces. What do you mean he's got enough on you? I just found out that alibi I put over, that was a fake. George, you don't mean to tell me Yes, that... I do. It's subornation of perjury and they can prove it. They can't get me on a criminal charge. The statute of limitations has run out. But what's the difference? They can disbar me, and they will. Oh, George, how did you ever get yourself mixed up in anything like that? Now, don't ask me. I was just a fool, that's all. This kid, Bryson, had stolen $12 out of a locker in the bathhouse. Well, I advised him to plead guilty and get off with a few months. And then I discovered he was a fourth offender and conviction meant a life sentence. Well, I didn't know what to do about it. So finally, Bryson said he could get a fellow named Whitey Cushing to swear that he was in his home in Jamaica the day the robbery was committed. Uh -huh. I'd known the kid and his family since heaven only knows when. I knew he'd go straight if I got him off. I was so anxious to save him from a life sentence that I never bothered to check his alibi. And now the chickens are coming home to roost. Yeah, that's pretty bad. <laughs> it's funny in a way. For years, Mr. Francis Clark Baird has been trying to get something on me, and every time he's drawn a blank. And now, this one thing that was dead and buried and forgotten falls right into his lap. It's as good as if I'd misappropriated a million dollars. 
Can't you bluff it through, George? I don't think so. I've been over the record and it's phony right on his face. And now I found out from Bryson that Cushing was in the hospital on the day of the robbery. That sews it up for me good and proper. Oh, this. It's rich, isn't it? I guess there's not much good going to Francis Clark Baird with the whole story. <laughs> That's a laugh, John. You might just as well throw a biscuit to a man-eating tiger. Yes, what is it? You please tell Mr. Simon I've got Mrs. Simon on the phone. Okay. Oh, Cora, hello, darling. Well, George, I must say you are a strange one. First, you stand me up for lunch. I'm sorry, darling. Really, I am. I just couldn't help it. Are you angry with me? I tried to get you last night and you were out. They didn't know where you were. I dined at the Meldons. They were giving a birthday party for Irene, remember? You're so busy, I suppose you forgot that, too. Well, you're not angry, darling. That I couldn't get home last night? No, George. I'm getting sort of used to it. Well, I just couldn't help it, dear. Really, I couldn't. And listen, Cora, I've got bad news for you. Oh? About our trip to Europe, something of the utmost importance has come up. What is it? What's happened? Well, I can't very well tell you over the phone, dear. Where are you? In the apartment? I'll tell you what. I'll come right over. We can talk about it. Well, now, just a minute, George. I do think... I'll jump in a taxi and be right over. I'll be there in three minutes. But, George. Hello, George. He hung up. What's the matter, Cora? Anything wrong? There isn't any of my business. Roy, George tells me now that he can't go to Europe. Oh, really? Some business matter. Something's come up. He's coming over to tell me about it. Well, that's rather a bore, isn't it? After all your plans are made. Yes, it's most disturbing. But that's George for you. He's so impulsive, so impetuous. One never quite knows what to expect next. There's a way of carrying things by storm and sweeping you off your feet. You know, he carried me off and married me almost before I knew what was happening. It's rather exciting in a way, but... <laughs> Heavens, I seem to be telling you all my troubles. You know I'm interested. Yes, I do, Roy. Does this change in plans mean that you won't go to Europe either, Paul? I don't know. I haven't had time to think about it. I don't know what to do. I've made all my arrangements about the house and all, and I bought my clothes, and I'm meeting people in London and on the continent. It's really most upsetting. It does seem a shame to have to give it all up now. Cora, can I do anything? No, thanks, Roy. I'll just have to wait now and hear what George has to say. Well, if I can be of any help. Thanks, Roy. You're very sweet. You're very lovely. <laughs> Not that that statement's anything out of the ordinary. <laughs> Cora. Roy, do be careful. George will be here any minute now. You know, Cora, it's too bad. What? Too bad? About your European trip. You see, I've been thinking of going over myself. Had you, Roy? Merely in the hope of running into you somewhere, I can say. That would have been nice. Now, probably not going on at all. Oh, well, c'est la guerre. Roy, when would you be sailing if you did go? Oh, I don't know. I've nothing to keep me here. As a matter of fact, I was rather thinking of going on the Paris. The Paris? Yes, I talked to the French line this morning. As it happens, they do have a cabin. However, if you're not going to be on it, it's too bad. It would have been fun. Yeah, it would. I suppose if George can't make it, you wouldn't think of going without him. There's George now. Cora, where will you be later this afternoon? Where can I reach you? I'll call you at your place. Are you there, sweetheart? Here I am. Oh, darling. <laughs> oh, hello, Mr. Darwin. Hello, Simon. I've been keeping Cora company. It seems you've been neglecting her lately. Yes, I have been pretty busy. Darling, I got over as fast as I could. Well, I'll be going along. Goodbye, Simon. Goodbye, Mr. Darwin. Uh, did my secretary fix you up all right? Yes, thanks very much. Don't mention it. Goodbye, Cora. Au revoir, Roy. Don't bother, old man. I'll see myself out. Well, George, what's this all about? You're being very mysterious. Cora... I'm afraid the European trip is off. And that's what I'm faced with, Cora. But, George, I mean, I'm quite bewildered. Eighteen years I've been a full-fledged lawyer. Eighteen years and nobody's ever had anything on me. And then this... This, this one little thing that was dead and buried comes up and bingo, out I go like a candle. Oh, George, why do you have to deal with such people? I'm a lawyer, darling. Somebody's got to defend people who are accused of crime. And now they're going to disbar you, is that it? Yes, someone has found out. It's just my luck that it happens to be a man who's had it in for me for years. A gentleman by the name of Francis Clark Baird. Francis Clark Baird? Why, he's a very eminent lawyer, isn't he? He may be, for all I know. All I can tell you is he's got the drop on me and he's going to make me pay through the nose. Why do you always put things on a personal basis, George? 
Isn't it the duty of a man like Mr. Baird? No man has to break another man unless he wants to. And this bird wants to. Well, I really don't know what to say, George. It's most distressing. Of course, I'm quite willing to accept your explanation of the whole thing. And I, I do understand how you must feel about it. I knew you would, Cora. I know how you've had to struggle and work to get where you are. And it's all very admirable. But you know, George, it made it possible for you to accept things that are rather difficult for me to accept. What things, darling? I don't know. This sort of thing. There's something distasteful about the whole atmosphere of it. The association with criminals and perjurers. All this conniving that goes with it. And now this scandal. It will be a scandal, won't it? Newspaper publicity and all that. Well, I'll try to spare you all I can, darling. What are my friends going to say? How am I going to face them? Do they mean more to you than I do? Oh, that isn't the point. You know, George, it seems to me the best thing for me to do is to go to Europe, as I planned. If this thing blows over, let's hope it will, you can join me abroad later. If it doesn't... You mean you're going to walk out on me? That's a very crude way of putting it, George, and very unfair. It implies I'm deserting you when you need me. You know that isn't so. It isn't as though I could do anything to help you. It's just that at a time like this, Cora, I, I thought I'd like to have you around, that's all. Isn't that just a little selfish, George? Yes, I guess you're right. I guess it is selfish. It's just that I, I thought that maybe now I'm in trouble, you'd, you'd want to stay. But, George, I just told you. Won't you, Cora? Well, George, if you put it on that basis... You realize, of course, this all comes as a bit of a surprise. Maybe if you'd give me a few hours to think it over... Of course, darling, all the time you want, and I'm sorry if I seem demanding. That's all right, George. Just give me a little time to make up my mind. I'll call you later. Thanks, darling. Where will you be? In your office? Yes, I'll be there all evening working on this thing. I'm not going down without a fight, Cora. I'm not licked yet. Not by a long shot. <laughs> Charlie, here's what I want you to do. It's important and confidential. It's for me, personally. Look, boss, anything you want, you just say the word. After what you've done for me, Now, listen carefully, Charlie. I'm listening. I want you to find out all you can about Francis Clark Baird. You want him shadowed, is that it? Yes, that's it. I want to know how he spends his time and who his friends are and where he goes nights. I get you. I want to know everything, only you've got to go about it carefully and fast. Don't you worry about that, Chief. Now, get on this job right away. Let everything else go for the present, you understand? You betcha. And give me a report of everything he does. Now, leave it to me, Chief. I got lots of ways of finding things out. Now, never mind the expense. Whatever you do, keep it under your hat. I got you, Chief. Mum's the word. That's it. Rexy, will you come in? So long. So long, Charlie. Yes, Mr. Simon. Rexy, I put Charlie McFadden on a job that'll keep him busy for several days. I don't want him interfered with, you understand? Yes, sir. Oh, and Mr. Simon. Yes. Your wife's on the phone. Will you take it? Of course I will. Why didn't you tell me? Mr. Simon, you said you didn't want anybody... Don't be ridiculous. Yes, yes, darling. Of course I do. No matter what it is. Yes, Cora. Oh. Yes. Yes, I see. You're sailing on the Paris? Yes. Yes, of course, I understand. Yes. Yes, it was selfish of me. Yes, darling, I do. I, I'm not sure I can get out home tonight. I will if I can. If I have to stay in town, I'll call you in the morning. Goodbye, darling. Excuse me, Mr. Simon. Well? Mr. Simon, I hope you don't mind my asking you. Yes, yes, what is it? Is there anything wrong? Of course not. Why should anything be wrong? Because if there's anything I could do... You can mind your own business. That's what you can do. Fortunes come in pairs. 
facing almost certain investigation by the Bar Association, George Simon is virtually deserted by his wife. Let us leave Rexy minding her own business and Charlie McFadden discreetly shadowing pompous lawyer Baird and seek a moment's relaxation in the company of Kenneth Banghart. The next time you find yourself in a group talking about cars, and you probably will before long, notice how quickly the conversation comes around to Mercury. It's almost certain to, because people all over the country are talking about the all-new 1949 Mercury. That's because the new Mercury is not just a facelifting job, not just a so-called new model. It's the all-new 1949 Mercury, planned, designed, and built to be the newest and best car in its field. When the Lincoln Mercury division of the Ford Motor Company set out to build new cars, it intended them to be really new. And from parking light to taillight, the 1949 Mercury is new. All new. Under the hood, there's a new engine, designed and built exclusively for Mercury, created to give you all new driving experience. There's a new stronger chassis, new wider, safer rims and super balloon tires, new more comfortable spring, bigger windshield and windows, new ventilation, new dashboard, and new comfort zone seating, even new armrests. And overall, Mercury has new style and graceful, eye-filling beauty. A look of handsome, rugged quality all its own. The 1949 Mercury has been designed and built to give you all new beauty, comfort, and performance. And an all new sense of pride in owning a big and beautiful car. If you haven't seen the 1949 Mercury yet, you should. You're going to be hearing a lot about Mercury from now on. And no matter what make of car you prefer... Mercury will give you a new idea. It will show you how new a car can be. Visit your neighboring Mercury showroom soon. See not just a new model, but the all-new 1949 Mercury. of the Ford Theater's presentation of Elmer Rice's famous drama, Counselor at Law. A few days have passed. It's late afternoon. Heading west across Manhattan for the French Line Pier is a taxi bearing Cora Simon and her expensive luggage. While in the offices of Simon and Tedesco, the business day is drawing to a close. Simon and Tedesco, who's calling, please? I'm sorry, Mr. Simon's out of town. No, I don't know when he'll be back, but I'll give you a secretary. Go ahead. Hello, Gracie. You still there? Hey, can you imagine what happened? This afternoon, about an hour ago, a man jumped out of about a 12-story window right in front of my eyes. Well, I'll say it is. I could see him through the window clear as anything. Makes me sick to my stomach just to think about it. Oh, wait a minute. Simon and Tedesco. No, I'm sorry, Mr. Simon's out of town. I'll put you through to his secretary. Hello, Mr. Simon's office. Miss Gordon, it's Colonel Westbrook calling Mr. Simon. I'll take it. Hello, Colonel Westbrook. I'm sorry, but Mr. Simon's out of town. Yes, I am expecting him. He's due back this evening. Yes, I'll tell him. Mr. Simon isn't back yet, Rexy? No, Mr. Tedesco. It's after five. He may have gone right to the French Line Pier. Mrs. Simon sailing at six on the Paris. Yes, I know. Mr. Tedesco, I... I hate to seem curious, but Mr. Simon's in some kind of real trouble, isn't he? I'm sorry to say he is, Rexy. Isn't there anything that we could... I'm afraid there isn't, Rexy. Not a thing. Mr. Tedesco... You know, sometimes I wonder if it's worth all the... Hello, John. George. Hey, good afternoon, Mr. Simon. Hello, Rexy. Mr. Simon, your wife called a few minutes ago. Did she get her right back? I'm afraid she's left the apartment by now. She's on her way to the pier. Well, I'm going down. Tell the boys to have a taxi ready for me downstairs in three minutes. Yes, sir. Well, George, how did you make out in Washington? How do you think? We might just as well have saved ourselves a trip. What did the senator say? The usual line of bull about what a great guy I am and how he loves me like a brother. Well, is he going to do something about it? Not a thing. But didn't you remind him if it hadn't been for you, he'd never have gotten the nomination? Oh, what's the use? If he doesn't know it already, it's because he doesn't want to know it. This is a cutthroat world, John. It's every man for himself. So? What are you going to do now, George? Not a thing. 
Tomorrow morning at 10, the Grievance Committee meets and listens to the words of Mr. Francis Clark Baird. After that, I can kiss my career goodbye. I haven't got a chance. I'm through. I'm finished. Well, I gotta go down to the boat now and say goodbye to my wife. She's about all I've got left. Anything I can do? Not a thing, John. Thanks. I'll see you in the morning. Good night. Good night. Well, I don't know, Gracie. After that, the ambulance came and they took him away. Oh, hold on a minute. Will hey, you? Bessie, it's nearly six. Why don't you go home? I was waiting for you, Mr. Simon. Well, don't. Go home. Haven't you got a boyfriend? <laughs> Rexy, did you get that cab? Yes, Mr. Simon. The boy's downstairs holding it. Good. Rexy, what do you think you're doing? I'm ringing for the elevator. I mean, why are you following me around? I'm going down with you, Mr. Simon. What for? To see that everything's all right. What are you talking about? Of course everything's all right. Did you arrange about the books and flowers for the boat? Yes, sir. Fresh flowers every day? Yes, sir. Oh, good evening, Mr. Simon. Go on down. Good evening, Joe. That was quite an excitement we had around here this afternoon. That man jumping out of the window, was it, now? Why did he do it? Anybody know? Couldn't tell you, Mr. Simon. Just crazy, I guess. Maybe he wasn't so crazy. What do you mean, Mr. Simon? Maybe he's better off that way. His troubles are over. They sure are. He's got nothing to worry about anymore. Mr. Simon, you don't really mean... Here you are, Mr. Simon. Good night. Good night, Joe. Now, what's the matter with you, Rexy? Nothing. Well, then what are you crying about? I'm not crying. It's nothing, nothing at all. Rexy, what's been wrong with you lately? There's nothing wrong with me. Well, maybe you've been working too hard. Maybe you ought to have a vacation. I don't want a vacation. Maybe I'll be going away myself soon. Then you'll get a good rest. A real long rest. I don't want a rest. There's your cab now. I'll wait up in the office, and if there's anything you want... No, there's not a thing I want. Go back upstairs. Yes, sir. Well, go on! Here you are, Mr. Simon. Here's your cab. Thanks, Henry. Here's a buck. Go to the ball game tomorrow. Oh, gee, thanks, Mr. Simon. Thanks a lot. Where to, mister? Go to the French Line Pier and hurry. Hey, Mr. Simon! Hold it, Captain. Hold it, Captain. Hey, Mr. Simon. Wait, it's me, Charlie McFadden. I'll see you later, Charlie. Chief, I, I gotta see you now. No, I haven't time. But, Chief, this is important. Well, you can tell it to me in the morning. No, I can't, Chief. This won't wait. I got news. News? About what? About our friend. What friend? You mean Baird? That's him, sir. I got news for you about Mr. Francis Clark Baird that will knock your eye out. Here's a buck, Cabby. I won't need you after all. Come on, Charlie. Upstairs. <laughs> It's the truth, sir. Help me. Your friend, Mr. Francis Clark Baird, is leading a double life. What do you mean, he's leading a double life? Well, wait until I tell you, Chief. Remember me telling you how I found out he's always making business trips to Philadelphia? Yes, well? Well, yesterday, off he goes to the Pennsylvania station and boards a train to Philly with me right behind him. Well? Well, he gets out of the station and hops a taxi for Germantown. So I grabs another hack and tells the driver to follow him. Yes, go on. Well, we're going along great. When all of a sudden, we get into a traffic jam, and by the time we get it straightened out, we lost him. Well, is that all? Gosh, no, that's just the beginning. I goes back to the station and hangs around, waiting to see if the other taxi's going to come back. Well, after waiting about three hours, sure enough, that kid comes. Was Baird in it? Uh, no, sir, he wasn't. Well, go on, go on! Well... I gets talking to the driver and asks him if he remembers. He says he does. He takes the same man out every week to visit his niece. Germantown on Sycamore Drive, number 1217 at once. So I drive out to 1217, and it's uh, dark by now, so I looks in the window. And there is the girl. A good looker, too, she is. And there is a photograph of Baird over the mantelpiece. Was Baird there? Uh, no, sir, he was not. Well, what is all this? What proof have you got that he ever was there? Uh, wait a minute, Chief. I ain't done yet. I says to myself, that little lady don't look like no niece to me. Is that what you call evidence? Mm, no, sir. Well, go on. But now there's nothing to do until everybody's in bed. Then I goes back to 1217 and takes a look into the house. What do you mean? You broke into the house? Well, no, I wouldn't want to admit that, Chief. I'd be liable to arrest and imprisonment if I did. Are you crazy? What'd you do a thing like that for? Uh, now, don't worry about me, Chief. It was an easy job. You know... I ain't as much out of practice as I thought I'd be. Well, what did you find out? Well, I figured that there'd be letters from him. 
And uh, what? You found letters from Bayard to this woman? A whole stack of them. Well, where are they? What do they say? Right here, Chief. They're all about how much she loves her and adores her, and about how she don't have to worry about her future if she'll just lie low and keep her mouth shut. Oh, Charlie, you don't know what you've done for me. Well, it's the least I could do, Chief, after all you've done for me. Rexy! Rexy! Yes, Mr. Thomas? Call up the French line. No, no, no. Wait a minute. Take this note and send it by messenger right away. You ready? Yes, sir. Darling, don't sail. Come and get right off the boat. Everything's going to be all right, and I'll be able to go with you in a few days. Phone me the instant you get this. All my love, darling. Did you get that? Yes, Mr. Simon. Then get it off and get me Francis Clark Baird on the phone right away. Yes, sir. Rexy, I think this time we've got Mr. Francis Clark Baird just exactly where we want him. This way, Mr. Baird. No, no, after you, please. Thank you. Well, then we're all agreed, and I'll send you the papers in the morning. Very well. And I'm sorry I had to get you over here in such a hurry. Oh, Mr. Baird, I want you to meet my secretary, Miss Gordon. How do you do, Miss Gordon? How do you do? You know, Mr. Baird, she's a regular shrew. She doesn't leave me a moment's peace. As a matter of fact, if it wasn't for Miss Gordon here... I'm afraid I really must be going. I understand, Mr. Baird. It is getting late, isn't it? Well, thanks for coming in. And why don't you drop in someday and have lunch with me? Thank you very much. Good evening, Miss Gordon. Good evening, Simon. Good evening, Baird. (laughs) Mr. Francis Clark Baird. (laughs) My pal. Rexy, what are you still doing here? Didn't I tell you to go home? I'm in no hurry. (laughs) Go home, I tell you. Don't you know there's a law against night work for women? You sure you don't need me anymore? I'm quite sure, and if you don't go right away, I'll drop you out the window. Go on, run along. Well, I'll get my things. Good night, Mr. Simon. Good night, Rexy. Hello? Hello? Yes, Cora, darling. This is me speaking. Listen, sweetheart, I've got some wonderful news for you. Yes, yes. Listen, everything's all right. You know, Mr. Francis Clark Baird, that little matter? Well, it's all fixed up. Listen, darling, get right off the boat. You've only got ten minutes. Why, but didn't you get my note? Well, then, but you still have time to get off. We'll have a little celebration tonight, just the two of us, you and I. We'll... Darling, it's only postponing it a few days, but... Oh, you... You mean you don't want to? I see. Yes, yes, sure, I understand. I I wouldn't want you to do anything unreasonable. No, 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 it's all right. No. No, thanks. Well, Cora, have a... Wonderful trip. Goodbye. Mm. Hello. I'd like to speak to Mr. Roy Darwin, please. He's out? Oh, that's so. He left for Europe? When did he sail? At six this evening, you mean? I see. Uh, hello. You happen to know the boat he's sailing on? The Paris? Thank you. Mr. 
that window. What do you want here? Don't jump, please. Didn't I tell you to go home? I was in the cloakroom. I was putting on my hat and coat. You've been hanging around spying on me. That's what you've been doing. No, I haven't, honest. I haven't. Don't lie to me. You've been spying on me for days. I couldn't go home. I was so worried about what you might do. What do you care what I do? What business is it of yours? I do care, and it is my business. Because you're a great man, Mr. Simon. No. And if anything happened to you, it'd, it'd be dreadful. Not just because of you, but because of all the people who depend on you and who need you. People you've been helping and doing things for all these years. You don't even know what you're doing for them half the time or what you mean in their lives. But if anything happened to you and you weren't here, they'd be lost. They wouldn't know where to turn people like me. I know if anything happened to you, I... I just could I just wouldn't want to go out and live. <laughs> Thanks, Rexy. Thanks. Thanks a lot. I'm sorry to say, though, Rexy, you're going to have to look for another job. I'm getting out of this business. I can't take it anymore. I'm through. Shall I answer it? If you want to. Hello? Yes. Yes, this is Mr. Simon's office. Who's calling, please? It's Mr. Theodore Wingdale, president of the American Steel Company. Shall I say you're not in? I don't care what you say. I'm afraid he's gone, Mr. Wingdale. Is there anything I can do? This is his secretary speaking. No, I don't. Just one moment. He says it's a matter of life and death. What do I care? Tell him... That Wingdale himself? Yes. Well, tell him I... Wait a minute. I'll talk to him. Hello, Mr. Wingdale. Yes, this is George Simon talking. Yes, she got me just as I was getting into the elevator. Well, what's the trouble? I see. Is that so? Yes. Have the police been there? I see. Well, you haven't made any statements, have you? No, 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 that's right. Don't say anything. Not a word. I'll be right up. Goodbye. Wingdale's son had a fight with his wife this afternoon and shot her dead. Oh, how awful. She was the richest girl in Texas. Can you imagine what a case that's going to be? we got to get right on the job. Rexy. I'm ready. You're always ready. That's one thing I can count on. What? Nothing, nothing. Come on, hurry. We'll grab a sandwich on the way up. Well, what are you waiting for? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, officially brings our play to a close. There is no objection whatever to your adding a brief fourth act of your own devising concerning the professional and personal future of George Simon and Rexy Gordon. In today's Ford Theater production of Counselor at Law, George Simon was played by Les Tremaine, one of radio's most popular actors. Our chorus Simon was Doris Dalton, well known on Broadway and to radio listeners. Rexy Gordon was played by Tony Darnay, and Lauren Gilbert was heard as Roy Darwin. Next Sunday afternoon, the Ford Motor Company offers you a very cordial invitation to join us again. On that occasion, we shall have the pleasure of bringing you a radio version of one of the best motion pictures ever made about the motion picture business. With laughter and with tears, the Ford Theater will tell the story of how a star is born. Counselor at Law was written by Elmer Rice, adapted for radio by John Houseman, and edited by Howard Teichman. The musical score was composed and conducted by Lynn Murray, and the entire production was under the direction of George Zachary. Other players heard in today's cast were Walter Burke, Gene Ellen, Richard Gordon, Adelaide Klein, Bill Quinn, Florence Robinson, and Bill Zucker. <laughs> Next week, 
A Star is Born. The Ford Theater is presented by the Ford Motor Company, makers of Ford, Mercury, and Lincoln cars, and Ford trucks, farm tractors, and industrial engines. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.